All right, everyone. Hello and good evening, and welcome back to the Diabetes Channel. Jazz over here, and today we have a very, very, very special guest. This is someone that I have known for the last twelve years, um, and I am very excited for today's session because today we have with us Dr. Ramesh Goyal, who is my doctor, who is my endocrinologist, my the person who diagnosed me when I was thirteen years old. and he is the first person that i told the idea of diabetes to as well and he has been so supportive he's an incredible doctor and i'm very very happy to have him here with us today um and this is dr ramesh goel he's an md dm endocrinology from aims new delhi he's a senior consultant and hod of the department of endocrinology and diabetes at apollo hospital which is also my hospital um he is a consultant in endocrinologist and uh he also has his private practice he is the faculty for certificate course in evidence based diabetes management um he is a faculty for fellowship in diabetes and of course he is awarded as the best diabetologist in 2018 and best endocrinologist in 2018 and 19 um in amdavad from the times of health icons and i give all those prizes to him also i think he is the best endocrinologist i think he is the best diabetologist so dr ramesh welcome and thank you for taking your time out to do this with us good evening everybody and uh, i am really thankful to jazz uh, for inviting me in this uh, special program of uh, diabetes i am glad to be here jazz oh thank you so much and uh, just to get everyone on board august is the month where we have themes every month for diabetes and this month is a very special theme and the hashtag for this month is are divano type pehchano so i know diabetes is predominantly not predominantly i think all of diabetes people are all type 1 diabetics but it's very important for us to understand that diabetes is not just a general term diabetes actually has many different types and some that i was not aware about till recently So we thought that this program, which is called Know Your Type by Dr. Ramesh Goel, will give us an insight about the several different types of diabetes, the diagnosis of them, how do we identify them, and mostly how it's so important to always mention the type of diabetes when you are talking about diabetes. Because I know that हम लोग को काफी मिलता है कि अच्छा तुम्हें diabetes है तुम ये कर दो ये कर दो diet कर दो insulin क्यों ले रहे हो? Not knowing that what type of diabetes we have. the pathology the treatment the physiology of all these diabetes are very different so uh, we have a lot of people watching already so welcome everyone um so let's get into it dr ramesh um starting off with i would like to know your understanding and your thoughts on the idea of how people always just say diabetes and nobody really mentions the type so what are your views on this so diabetes is a very common term and yeah. uh, it is uh, i often uh, use loosely so first of all when we talk about diabetes uh, again we have to differentiate between uh, diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus so basically diabetes is uh, any form of uh, polyuria they used to call uh, diabetes and uh, then we came to know that the polyuria can be due to high sugar and then came the word uh, diabetes mellitus or it can be due to the dysfunction of uh, the posterior pituitary gland so where uh, the hormone which uh, controls uh, the production of uh, urine is deficient or it is not working so it is called diabetes insipidus so these are two types of uh, diabetes i will say uh, in general diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus and again diabetes insipidus has two subtypes but uh, i am not going in detail of uh, diabetes insipidus because the blood sugar is normal in patients with diabetes insipidus and they have uh, deficiency of other hormone that is the anti diuretic hormone Uh, because of which uh, they are having polyuria or excessive urine and treatment is a replacement of the anti diuretic hormone so that's yeah. a, a different type of uh, kind of diabetes i will say not type and now i'll talk about uh, diabetes mellitus so in diabetes mellitus uh, broadly the american diabetes association uh, american diabetes association now recognizes uh, four types of uh, uh, diabetes mellitus and out of them only two are numbered so uh, mm -hmm. the official designation is only for type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in terms of the numbers and uh, the third type is uh, the gdm 
and yeah. the fourth type is the other type of diabetes and it's a very broad term uh, other type of diabetes uh, they are rare type of diabetes and it includes uh, the uh, monogenic diabetes like the neonatal diabetes or the modi uh, which yeah. we'll be discussing uh, in detail uh, further on and uh, there are other uh, diabetes uh, due to pancreatic pathologies you know, due yeah. to the disease of pancreas so uh, you must all be aware that uh, it is uh, uh, the pancreas the precisely the islet cell of pancreas which uh, produces the insulin yeah. so if uh, there is a disease of uh, the pancreas in general the islet cells also get involved so that is yeah. called a uh, uh, other type of diabetes we used to call it secondary diabetes but now it is clubbed uh, in the category of other type of diabetes so it includes uh, the pancreatic diseases like pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis or there can be any pancreatic uh, tumor requiring surgery so a uh, part of uh, the pancreas is removed which also removes the insulin producing the islet cells uh, which uh, secrete the insulin and uh, there are certain drugs uh, which can cause diabetes uh, like corticosteroids which were very commonly used in this uh, covid patients so yeah. we had a lot of uh, patients who developed the diabetes uh, because of corticosteroids uh, wow. basically this uh, corticosteroids they are uh, producing insulin resistance in the body so the yeah. insulin is uh, not uh, able to work properly in presence of corticosteroids but fortunately for most of the patients once you stop this corticosteroids the patient uh, develops a normal glycemia they don't require any medication after that mm -hmm. there are certain other drugs uh, like uh, antipsychotic some and atypical antipsychotic or the psychiatric medicines can cause uh, high blood sugar and certain hiv medicines they can also mm -hmm. cause uh, high blood sugar so okay. in uh, the last category that is the other type of diabetes uh, there are various uh, uh, types of uh, the pathophysiologies which are clubbed under one heading so basically there are four headings and uh, uh, you can uh, uh, go with the type of the diabetes we will uh, discuss in detail each type fabulous okay so i think that was a very great introduction just to let everyone know that koi ab jab diabetes bol rahe ho sirf diabetes mat bolo because i think what dr ramesh has very clearly said is there are so many different types subtypes um different categories diabetes mellitus diabetes insipidus so i think the message that we want to give off hand right off the bat is that diabetes is not just a singular word there needs to be a preface of saying what type of diabetes you are talking about so whenever you are communicating whether it is verbal whether you are writing a poster whether you are posting something on instagram or facebook always talk about the type so that other types don't get confused because hum log ko kafi log bolte hai who are type 1 in the diabetes say you don't need insulin you can control with diet which is not true they are talking about diabetes remission we see posters all the time dr goel on facebook yes, diabetes yes. remission workshop and yes. all our type one come to us saying didi ye to hai kya kare yes. and we like type 2 diabetes kabhi koi likhta nahi hai yeah they don't mention it so it's a uh, jazz it is uh, like uh, uh, you say that uh, means if you are having a say heart problem then you say you have to see a doctor but uh, now you have to specify whether you have to see a cardiologist a uh, gastroenterologist a endocrinologist so doctor is a very general term uh, you have to specify which doctor cardiologist if you go to a gastroenterologist with a heart problem you are at a wrong place so say, similarly diabetes is a very broad term you have to yeah. uh, speak specifically whether it's type 1 type 2 whether it's uh, modi whether yeah. it's lada so uh, these are the type of diabetes i think uh, we should all Uh, include in our vocabulary this types I totally agree so i think along with are divano type pehchano let's add are divano doctor pehchano also <laughs> and it's a great idea all right so i think now it's a good time to sort of go into each type so we have the expert over here so dr ramesh i'll just say a type out and then maybe you can just give us the basic understanding of what that type is how do you diagnose that type and what is the treatment for that particular type Okay, so I think let's begin with my type. So type one diabetes. <laughs> yeah, type one diabetes uh, is usually seen in children and young adults, but uh, it's uh, not a, a very specific uh, criteria because uh, type one diabetes uh, can occur in uh, even eighth or ninth decade of life. So wow. you can't uh, classify a person having. Uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes based only on age but yes type 1 diabetics are usually children or young adolescents and uh, 
uh, typically they lose their uh, beta cells uh, which produce insulin due to some autoimmune mechanisms and this autoimmune mechanisms uh, are triggered by certain genetic makeup of that individual it is not heredity it's a certain set of uh, genes uh, which come together the hla genes uh, which uh, predispose that child to produce uh, auto antibodies uh, and this auto antibodies they destroy the pancreatic uh, beta cells and there are certain environmental triggers also say some viral infections uh, uh, which uh, triggers this autoimmune response so it is a combination of the genetic makeup and some environmental trigger which uh, produces the auto antibodies uh, in the uh, uh, in the circulation of these children and these children start losing their beta cells and once they lose the 90% of their uh, beta cells they develop uh, diabetes usually uh, the there is no strong family history in patients with type 1 diabetes uh, though it can be genetically transmitted but uh, the family history is uh, more strong in patients with type 2 diabetes in type 1 diabetes we usually don't see a strong family history and uh, these children typically are insulin deficient so they require lifelong insulin therapy be it by injections uh, taken with syringes or pens or delivered via insulin pump but they require uh, insulin therapy for their survival and to manage their blood glucose and uh, type 1 uh, diabetics uh, they are prone to ketoacidosis so most of the uh, type 1 diabetics around 30% of type 1 diabetes uh, they present with ketoacidosis as a initial diagnosis mm. in emergency rooms and yeah. uh, 70% of uh, type 1 diabetics uh, they are picked up early uh, before they develop frank ketoacidosis so the parents uh, have to be cautious about uh, the symptoms of uh, the diabetes like uh, polyuria polydipsia polyphagia so increased thirst uh, increased urination increased hunger and uh, weight loss uh, despite good appetite so these right. are the warning signs uh, when the parent should uh, get the blood glucose of the children checked uh, to see whether they are having diabetes and if uh, they are detected having diabetes uh, timely treatment can uh, prevent the complication of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis but uh, nonetheless 30% of uh, patients still present with diabetic ketoacidosis uh, as a initial diagnosis and uh, as this is a diabetes group and uh, 100% of uh, the uh, members are type 1 diabetic you all must be aware that uh, the insulin is uh, mandatory and if you stop insulin accidentally or uh, due to you know, some propaganda of uh, diabetes reversal uh, and uh, uh, you going for this diabetes reversal program then you may end up in uh, uh, ketoacidosis and okay. jazz i want to say that uh, insulin omission is uh, not the only cause for ketoacidosis in type 1 diabetes uh, if type 1 diabetics uh, get some serious infection right or some other uh, serious physical problem like a urinary infection or a pneumonia or uh, a major trauma so despite taking uh, the insulin doses regularly they may still develop uh, uh, ketoacidosis because in any sort of stressful uh, situation the insulin requirement of uh, the body increases and right. uh, uh, your current uh, insulin dosage uh, might not be able to cope up with the increased requirements uh, in uh, face of uh, the disease or the physical stress so in uh, sick day guideline i think you must be talking about the sick day guideline so whenever a type 1 diabetic uh, patient is sick you should uh, check your glucose more frequently and you should take uh, the correction doses of uh, insulin if your sugar is persistently high fabulous so i think that's a great message out there no stopping insulin for those with type 1 diabetes it is more found in children but it can happen at any age type 1 diabetes um and like he said very seriously and very clearly that just it's not only stopping insulin that can give you dka so sick day rules very important to remember for all our t1d's watching and for all the parents watching here the four t's of diagnosis very important to remember uh, fabulous so that is about t1d let's move on to the diabetes that we all know which is type 2 diabetes so type 2 diabetes is the common type of diabetes and uh, around 95% of diabetic uh, patients are having type 2 diabetes right usually it occurs after age of 40 years but now uh, because of the increasing uh, prevalence and uh, because of uh, the wrong lifestyle that yeah. uh, we are more uh, sedentary 
and we uh, eat more of a wrong type of food uh, we do see now uh, type 2 diabetics uh, in even uh, the second and the third decades of life so okay. patients presenting with type 2 diabetes in the second or third decade of life uh, creates a confusion because uh, our traditional uh, teaching was that uh, diabetes in young is always type 1 diabetes and diabetes in uh, 40 years uh, plus age is always type 2 diabetes but now because of the changing pattern of type 2 diabetes uh, there is a lot of uh, overlap between uh, uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetics, uh, particularly in the patients who are diagnosed uh, in 20s and 30s. Right. So how do you differentiate uh, type 1 from type 2 diabetes uh, in this group of patients? So first and foremost, uh, uh, there is a strong family history of uh, diabetes in type 2 diabetes. Second, type 1 diabetics, uh, they are usually lean. Mm. They are non-obese. Whereas uh, type 2 diabetics, uh, usually 70 or 80 percent of them, I will say, are either mm. obese or overweight. Right. So uh, if a person is having strong family history and person is uh, overweight or obese, patient is having other risk factors like mm. uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, then high cholesterol levels. Mm. And uh, if a patient is having sedentary uh, lifestyle and if a patient is having the markers of insulin resistance. You know what are the markers of insulin resistance uh, you can visibly see uh, on the skin of a person. So there is a, a, a term called acanthosis nigricans. So I will uh, explain you in a simple way that acanthosis nigricans is a dark velvety appearance of the skin behind your neck. Okay. So uh, that is a marker of the insulin resistance. So typically wow. you must have seen in... Uh, many people that uh, their skin uh, or the nape of the neck is typically dark and velvety and uh, most of uh, the people think that it is uh, due to improper hygiene and the person is not taking uh, care of himself or herself uh, and this is the dirt which has accumulated but it's not dirt it's uh, a cutaneous or the skin marker of the insulin resistance and wow. you must have seen that uh, there are certain skin tags in uh, many uh, people in the same area so you can see it, uh, distinct skin tags uh, from the distance. So again, that is a marker of uh, insulin resistance. So if there are any markers of uh, insulin resistance which are visible, then yeah. it indicates uh, towards uh, a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Because in type 1 diabetes, you must all be knowing that there is no insulin resistance. There is right. absolute insulin deficiency. But in type 2 diabetes, there is a mixture of uh, insulin resistance. And because of this insulin resistance, the beta cells of the pancreas have to work more to produce more insulin so okay. over a period of time the beta cells they get fatigued and they yeah. uh, st they stop working or they uh, uh, work uh, in a suboptimal capacity because of the fatigue and this leads to a relative insulin deficiency hmm. and why do type 1 go in ketoacidosis and why doesn't type 2 go into ketoacidosis the explanation is that in type 1 diabetics, uh, there is absolute insulin deficiency. So some amount of insulin is required in body to right. control the ketone bodies. So that is very less amount of insulin. Typically, the insulins uh, which do not control the blood glucose level, the blood glucose mm -hmm. levels may still remain high with that yeah. minimal insulin. But it is sufficient to prevent the formation of ketone bodies. So in type 2 diabetes, uh, this uh, bare amount of insulin is still being secreted in the circulation to prevent uh, ketosis but not uh, enough to control the blood glucose and that's the reason they have high blood sugars but they do not develop a uh, ketoacidosis and uh, type 2 diabetics uh, typically can be controlled with uh, diet exercise and oral medicines and uh, uh, many or most of the type 2 diabetics may not require insulin through their throughout their uh, lifetime they can live their life uh, with diet, exercise and oral tablets only. But there are few uh, type 2 diabetic patients uh, who are having long-standing diabetes uh, who have significant depletion of their beta cell because of the wear and tear. And uh, the insulin secretion, it uh, goes uh, uh, critically at a low level and the tablets are no longer working. So in the, this group of uh, type 2 diabetics, I will say around uh, 20 to 30 percent of type 2 diabetics uh, may require insulin therapy in the later course of their disease. So that is the main uh, differentiation between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the 
presentation is uh, abrupt in type 1 diabetes the child okay. comes with uh, the symptom of uh, the polyuria polydipsia polyphagia and diabetic ketoacidosis within months or days of developing diabetes whereas type 2 diabetics uh, they remain asymptomatic for a long period of time because uh, the symptoms uh, and the blood glucose they are not uh, dramatic the right. blood glucose gradually starts rising and it uh, may take uh, four five or more years for the blood glucose to rise to a sufficient level to cause symptoms to the patient so typically most of the type 2 diabetics uh, they are diagnosed uh, uh, during a routine health checkup uh, or uh, when they are buying an insurance policy on or, or uh, whenever they are casually checking their blood glucose some of their family members may have diabetes and they might be casually checking their glucose and they may get a shock uh, seeing their blood glucose as uh, 250 or uh, 300 so right. mostly it is asymptomatic uh, and type 1 diabetics uh, they are mostly symptomatic Fabulous. Wow. I think we all learned quite a lot about that. Uh, the presentation on your body and skin is something that I also had no idea about. So that's a great, great um, differentiation as well as understanding the basic bodily differences of somebody with type 1 and type 2. And like Dr. Ramesh said that we are seeing now more early onset of type 2 diabetes as well. So Dr. Ramesh, what would be your sort of advice for someone who's maybe 25, 26 who's been diagnosed with, who has high blood sugar, how would they sort of understand, is there some kind of a test that they can do that can confirm whether it's type 1 or type 2? Yeah. So initially I talked about this uh, history taking and clinical features. And yes. uh, uh, to stamp uh, the diagnosis of uh, type 1 or type 2, you require lab investigations. So yes. first and foremost, uh, the person should be diabetic and that's the reason we are testing. So right. you have to get uh, blood glucose and HbA1c tested. That is for diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. And for the type of diabetes, uh, you can uh, check uh, uh, blood ketone levels. If blood ketone yeah. levels are present or positive, it indicates type 1 diabetes. If it is uh, negative, it indicates type 2 diabetes. You can check a blood uh, uh, report called C-peptide. So right. C-peptide is a test which gives us an idea of uh, how much... Uh, insulin your body is producing so if c peptide is uh, very low or if it is undetectable that means uh, your body is not producing insulin at all and in typical in type 1 we see these values either very low or uh, zero and in type 2 diabetics uh, usually the c peptide levels uh, are normal or they are high so why they are they can be high because i said that in type 2 diabetes uh, the main culprit is insulin resistance that yeah. is uh, the insulin is not working properly the way it should be working in their bodies and so the body tries to compensate by producing more insulin initially that oh, insulin okay. resistance. so uh, the c peptide levels initially in type 2 diabetics may be actually high amazing but okay. uh, that's one of the differentiating point between type 1 and type 2 and there are certain uh, auto antibodies uh, to uh, the islets so yeah. commonly we test uh, GAD65 antibody. So GAD65 antibody is uh, present in uh, most of the patients with type 1 diabetes, at least uh, uh, for initial couple of years uh, after the diagnosis. After that, the titer may go on declining, but uh, okay. initially it is uh, strongly positive. There are other antibodies also, the insulin antibodies, the um, islet cell antibodies, uh, which can be tested. But most commonly we test uh, the yeah. islet cell, uh, sorry, uh, the GAD65 antibody. And this uh, GAD65 antibody or other antibodies, if, if you're testing other antibodies, actually it stems the diagnosis of autoimmune right. type 1 diabetes. So that is the diagnostic test. But uh, uh, Jazz, uh, uh, having said that, this test is not mandatory to start the treatment for type 1 diabetes. So sure. it's not recommended for all patients. You may still start uh, treatment as type 1 diabetes depending on the serum acetone, C-peptide level and the blood glucose levels and the clinical presentation. And you can still make a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes without autoantibody test. And autoantibody auto tests are also important in the uh, siblings and the first degree relatives of uh, patients with type 1 diabetes. So suppose okay. a person is having type 1 diabetes and your siblings are concerned that they may develop diabetes. So 
uh, you, they can go for a auto antibody test in the siblings if two or more antibodies are uh, positive in the siblings that indicate that they may uh, may develop a type 1 diabetes uh, subsequently in the course of, in, of their life so okay. the so the statistics say that uh, if uh, two or more antibodies are auto antibodies are positive in your sibling huh. i mean type 1 diabetes there are 70 percent chances that uh, he or she will develop diabetes type 1 diabetes uh, after, uh, uh, within 10 years and there are 85 percent chances that he or she will develop type 1 diabetes within 15 years oh my god okay i'm gonna get my brother tested now <laughs> for sure. the siblings uh, can get an idea that right. uh, whether they are uh, uh, going to develop type 1 or type or not uh, in the future based on this antibody test wow. and uh, uh, till now we don't have any therapy uh, mm -hmm. to reverse uh, this antibody or to prevent a type 1 diabetes once you detect that a person is having antibody positivity then you can't do anything you just mm -hmm. have to keep on monitoring the blood glucose uh, maybe every six months or every one year and once uh, the diabetes develops then you can start the treatment early instead of waiting right. for a decay, uh, for a ketoacidosis but yeah. having said that there are uh, various uh, trials going on just now in patients uh, uh, or the siblings of the patients with type 2 di type 1 diabetes who are antibody positive and uh, uh, these trials are directed to prevent the development of uh, type 1 diabetes in these children okay. so uh, that is a very exciting area of research and yeah. uh, if there is a breakthrough in this, uh, then uh, at least uh, the siblings and the first degree relatives can be picked up uh, by the antibodies and they can be prevented from going to type 1 diabetes. But that is a, a futuristic thing. <laughs> Absolutely. No, fabulous. I think this was very, very helpful. Um, so all of them. Yes, yeah, so we will answer all your questions once we just finish this. There are a lot of questions coming in, which we'll get to in a bit. So uh, fabulous. So I think we just talked about the stamp marker if there's any confusion and hesitation of the type as dr ramesh said the c peptide the gad 65 another few and auto antibody tests can confirm the diagnosis uh, so that's type 1 type 2 and the difference is very clear let's move on to something that a lot of people do not know about which is gdm gestational diabetes mellitus over to you so gestational uh, diabetes mellitus is uh, uh glucose intolerance which is uh, detected during the pregnancy for the first time Right. So now this is a very uh, broad terminology, GDM, because okay. uh, it uh, includes uh, those patients who are having pre-existing diabetes but who are undiagnosed. And because of pregnancy, they got their sugars checked uh, and they were detected having diabetes. So okay. actually, these people are having pre-existing diabetes who are not diagnosed uh, prior to pregnancy. And pregnancy gave the opportunity to check their blood glucose and they were diagnosed. There is another category of uh, patients uh, did not have diabetes prior to pregnancy but uh, because of the pregnancy in pregnancy mm -hmm. there is uh, increased metabolic uh, demands in the body of the mother because of the developing fetus there are certain hormonal changes so to be very technical i'll say there is a hormone called human placental lactogen hpl human okay. placental lactogen so that uh, causes insulin resistance and oh. uh, the level of hpl it goes on rising uh, uh, throughout the gestation so uh, the insulin resistance it peaks around 24 to 28 weeks okay. it is uh, during this period of time during the period of 24 to 28 weeks of the gestation we advise a glucose tolerance test that is the glucose challenge test there are various uh, protocols available but uh, i follow a protocol of that uh, 75 gram oral glucose uh, given empty stomach and checking the blood glucose in fasting state one hour post glucose and two hours post glucose and there are certain specific cutoffs uh, which if exceeded uh, 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 leads to the diagnosis of the gdm so these cutoffs are again very technical i'll just uh, quote it quickly that uh, fasting uh, plasma glucose more than 92 and uh, mm -hmm. one hour post glucose uh, more than 180 or uh, two hours post glucose more than 153 so any one of this uh, abnormal value amounts to diagnosis of uh, GDM. Okay. And uh, uh, the GDM is uh, uh, assuming uh, importance uh, uh, day by day because uh, more of uh, the younger population is being affected with uh, type 2 diabetes. So now 
the diagnosis of GDM is actually going up because of the mm -hmm. increasing prevalence of undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. And um, the immediate uh, consequence to the mother and the fetus is that uh, there is increased risk of uh, congenital malformation. If uh, a, a, a woman is having pre-existing uh, diabetes, which was undiagnosed at the time of conception, there is mm -hmm. a risk of uh, congenital anomalies in the developing uh, fetus, which fortunately, the major congenital anomalies can be picked up uh, on a uh, fetal ultrasound. And uh, if uh, we detect it early, we can advise the termination of pregnancy on that grounds. But mm -hmm. uh, the message I want to pass on is that because since uh, all of you are diabetics, all of you are young and all of uh, you would get uh, married and uh, get pregnant. The thing is that uh, the HbA1c at the time of conception is very important. If okay. you maintain your HbA1c around 6 or 6.5 for uh, Type 2 diabetes, we call it, we take it uh, cut off as 6. And for type 1 diabetics, because it's not always possible to bring it down to 6 without significant hypoglycemia, we can accept uh, HbA1c between 6 to 7, but definitely not more than 7. If okay. uh, the HbA1c at time of conception is uh, controlled, then risk of uh, congenital malformation reduces significantly. But if HbA1c at time of conception is high, then the risk of congenital malformation increases and uh, you can't undo that uh, risk by uh, controlling the blood glucose subsequently. The damage done at conception is done. So you can't undo it. So it's uh, better that uh, all type 1 diabetics should uh, undergo a pre-pregnancy counseling. And uh, during that pre-pregnancy counseling, it is important that uh, they get sensitized uh, to the fact that their HbA1c should be controlled before they conceive rather than trying to achieve a, a good glucose control after they conceive. Right. And uh, there are other uh, risks uh, to the mother and the fetus also. There is an uh, increased risk of the pregnancy loss, that is abortions. Uh, then uh, for uh, maternal health, there is increased uh, risk of hypertension. There is uh, increased uh, uh, risk of uh, the caesarean sections, uh, uh, increased incidence of caesarean sections. Uh, and there is increased uh, uh, chances of uh, giving birth to large babies, uh, okay. having a weight of more than 4.5 kg. So, uh, the blood glucose control during the pregnancy is also very important. Otherwise, uh, the fetus, mother or the neonate uh, may land up in the metabolic problems. And uh, other thing about GDM is that uh, only insulin is the molecule which is approved. So all of you are type 1 diabetics. So whenever you get pregnant, you will get only insulin because you are type 1 diabetics. But even for type 2 diabetics, if they get pregnant, they have to shift themselves to the insulin therapy because insulin is the safest uh, drug uh, during the pregnancy. Right. And for someone who has GDM, is it possible that after they deliver, they cannot have diabetes? Yeah. So GDM uh, basically it exposes the beta cell uh, defect. Right. So in pregnancy, there is an additional demand on the beta cells. So mm -hmm. if uh, beta cells, they are inherently strong, they will cope up with that demand. And right. the uh, woman will not develop any glucose intolerance. But if uh, there is a defect in the beta cell, it gets exposed because of this okay. additional burden. So uh, during the routine life, the uh, beta cells, uh, they are able to cope up uh, with the uh, demands and they keep on uh, uh, secreting insulin uh, to maintain the blood glucose in the normal range. But with extra demand during the pregnancy, they start failing. And... Right. Uh, uh, that indicates that uh, genetically this beta cells they are weak so after this uh, uh, delivery the additional burden is gone so beta cell again starts uh, functioning uh, uh, normally. normally but uh, because they are inherently weak there is increased risk of uh, development of uh, diabetes uh, in the future in such ladies so the recommendation goes that uh, after delivery we should again recheck uh, for diabetes uh, after uh, 4 to 12 weeks by the glucose tolerance test and if uh, the glucose tolerance test is normal then we should uh, recheck every three years wow. because okay. there is uh, high chances of uh, these females uh, developing uh, diabetes uh, in the later life type one or type two type two mostly it is type two because uh, it's uh, not autoimmune it's not right. autoimmune right and okay. uh, and uh, uh, after uh, delivery when their blood glucose becomes normal, we still advise uh, these females uh, to follow a healthy diet and uh, re exercise okay. regularly so that they yeah. don't develop diabetes in future. Right. 
Okay, so we have got type one, type two, and GDM covered till now. Um, like I said, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in, and we will take them at the end. Before that, let's move on very quickly to LADA, uh, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. What is it? Is it like similar to type one? But just if you can explain LADA. So LADA is uh, basically type one diabetes. It's not similar. It it is type one diabetes. But uh, the only thing is that. Uh, it is seen in adulthood, not in okay. childhood. So first, okay. it is uh, it is it develops first in adulthood instead of childhood. As I said initially, that you yes. may see type one in the eighth and ninth decade of uh, life also. So right. I remember uh, there was one uh, patient who was hospitalized uh, with uh, a heart attack, and uh, I was asked to manage uh, the diabetes. So because uh, it was an emergency situation, I managed the patient on insulin. The patient mm. uh, improved uh, uh, in terms of the uh, glycemic control and the patient underwent angioplasty. Then the patient was discharged. At the time of uh, discharge, uh, I prescribed him tablet instead of okay. insulin because okay. he was 60 years old. So I said, okay, huh, uh, you can go on the tablet. And after two days, I got a phone call that uh, that person is having uh, difficulty in breathing, vomiting. The sugar is very high. So I immediately called that patient to hospital. The patient was having ketoacidosis. Oh. And uh, then again, the patient was managed with insulin. Patient improved. And I got the antibody test mm. then because the patient, uh, then I saw in more detail that uh, why did the patient develop ketoacidosis? So patient did not have any family history of diabetes. Patient was non-obese. His uh, BMI was 20. And uh, is HbA1c was uh, very high, and uh, uh, the GAD antibody was positive, the uh, in the next admission. So it uh, clinched the diagnosis of LADA. Wow! And, so uh, so the message I want to give uh, to everybody is that whenever you see a patient with so-called type two diabetes who is not having family history of diabetes, who is non-obese, and uh, who is having uh, very high sugars. Very high sugar means typically we don't see very uh, high sugar in type 2 diabetes. We don't see a fasting sugar of uh, 300 plus and a post prandial sugar of 400 plus in type 2 diabetes usually. But in type 1 diabetes, we see this extremely high sugars at the diagnosis. So whenever uh, you encounter such situation where the patient is not typically fitting in the frame of type 2 diabetes, you should always uh, think about a uh, LADA. LADA. And, uh, 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 now, uh, the American Diabetes Association no longer uses this word uh, LADA. They uh, call it as a type 1 diabetes. But still, okay. uh, commonly and clinically also, this uh, term is uh, used to uh, define our autoimmune diabetes, uh, which is seen in adulthood. But so what is the age group? Like what, what age after, if you diagnose with type 1, is it known as LADA? Is it post 30 years, post 40 so initially, uh, we used to say it is post 40. Okay. But now, as I said, that uh, American Diabetes Association has removed this demarcation. So there is no age demarcation between type 1 diabetes and LADA. It is only type 1 diabetes okay. and it is only autoimmune diabetes. Lovely. So we're all one family, everyone. Even if you've developed later, it's all type yeah. 1. Fabulous. Yeah, but uh, you should be antibody positive. Correct. Correct. Autoimmune. All our pancreases should be shut and dhanda ban for the type 1s. We are all insulin deficient. Correct. Permanent strike. Permanent strike. All right. So we let's move on to Modi, which a lot of people don't know about. So if you can just explain us Modi. Modi is a very rare form of uh, the other type of diabetes uh, in the American Diabetes Association classification. And uh, typically, the Modi patients... Uh, they present with diabetes uh, below the age of 25 years. So again, uh, this is a very arbitrary cutoff. And I will say 90% of Modi patients, uh, they present uh, below age of 25 years. Uh, but still 10% of patients can be more than 25 years of age. age. So, yeah. So it looks uh, very similar to type 1 diabetes. Modi patients, uh, they are non-obese. So again, very similar to type 1 diabetes. But the differentiating point is, in Modi patient, there is a strong family history. So okay. generations to generations, there is a history of diabetes. And uh, there is a, typically single parent is affected because it is autosomal dominant form of transmission. 
so okay. typically single uh, parent is affected and uh, he or she is also affected at a young age so you will get a history that father also developed diabetes at age of uh, say 25 years or 24 years grandmother got uh, the diabetes at age of 25 24 years so it is passed on from generation to generation in autonomous autosomal dominant fashion the sugars are not uh, typically very high so there are three distinct types of modi so there is one modi 2 Modi 2 is a condition where the patient presents with a fasting plasma glucose of around 150 to 250 and HbA1c around 5.6 to 7.6. So this is the typical range of sugars in Modi 2. And the studies have shown that most of the Modi 2 patients, they do not require any treatment with either insulin or any oral tablets. And they live a normal life without any diabetic complications till they leave. Modi 1 and Modi 3, they uh, require uh, oral tablets to control their blood glucose. So insulin is not mandatory for them. So they typically respond to the group of the drugs called sulfonylureas. Okay. And uh, they may uh, have normal blood glucose or controlled blood glucose on sulfonylureas for years and decades. And they may require insulin in the later part of their uh, disease. So they don't immediately require insulin. But as so, I said, uh, it's uh, very rare and uh, mm -hmm. most of the clinicians, uh, they fail to diagnose the, uh, that the child is having Modi and uh, they are treated as uh, type 1 diabetes often. So the right. things which uh, differentiate uh, Modi from type 1 is uh, a strong family history from generation to generation at a young age and uh, negative autoantibodies. The Modi patients, they never have the autoantibodies positive. Okay. So it that's the difference. Yeah. And that is the, uh, see the, just the, uh, uh, make it very clear. The autoantibodies are positive only in type 1. Type 1. So that is, uh, that's what I said. That is the stem for type 1, autoantibodies. Right. No other type of diabetes you will see autoantibodies positive. Right. So if uh, autoantibodies are negative, there is a strong family history from generation to generation at a young age of uh, diabetes, then you suspect that this is a, a modi. Mm -hmm. So this is a clinical diagnosis. Now, there are genetic testing also available. Right. So we call it monogenic uh, diabetes also because there is a defect in the single gene. Right. And you can pinpoint that uh, a single gene by the genetic studies. So in selected laboratories now in India also, we have that facility available. And uh, if we can get a genetic study, then you can label the uh, patient as having Modi and unnecessary insulin therapy or unnecessary treatment for Modi 2 with insulin mm -hmm. or oral tablets uh, can be avoided. Right. And what are the symptoms that they present with the diagnosis? Is it similar to type 1 and type 2? See, the, uh, symptoms are not dramatic. So okay. either uh, they are uh, uh, detected on a casual check or okay. they have very mild symptoms. So um, maybe they have gone to their uh, doctor with a febrile illness. The doctor checked the urine routine, suspecting a UTI. And the doctor sees a glycosuria in the urine. Right. So that is how it is picked up. Got it. Got it. So, so the symptoms are only dramatic in type 1. In type yeah. 2 and Modi, the symptoms are either absent or they are very subtle. Fabulous. Um, all right. And then before we move on to the DI, maybe we can just talk about the um, pancreatitis, which causes diabetes. So that type of diabetes, where it's caused because of something. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, that uh, initially we used to call it secondary diabetes, right. the diabetes which is caused due to the disease of the pancreas as an organ, as a whole organ, not only the beta cells, but right. as a whole organ. So if uh, there is a pancreatitis or a, if there is a pancreatic tumor or if right. there is an injury to the pancreas, physical injury to the pancreas or if there is a condition called cystic fibrosis or right. in some part of India, particularly Kerala and Tamil Nadu, we see uh, patients called uh, fibrocalcific uh, pancreatic diabetes. So okay. in this uh, uh, group of the patients, uh, they are having uh, very high sugars, but uh, they don't have autoantibodies. Uh, they never develop uh, ketoacidosis. And uh, when we get the X and they have chronic abdominal pain and chronic pancreatitis. And when we get their abdominal X-rays and sonographies, they have calcification in their pancreas. Wow. So we call it fibro calcific pancreatic diabetes and now american diabetes association also recognizes that entity uh, in the category of the other form of the diabetes so okay. uh, 
basically such patients of uh, the uh, this uh, pancreatic uh, diabetes they require insulin because uh, most of their beta cells and uh, in this uh, as opposed to the type 1 diabetes they lose their alpha cells also oh so it becomes more tricky to manage these patients because wow. uh, at least uh, type uh, 1 diabetics uh, they have intact uh, alpha cells so right. whenever uh, you get a hypoglycemia your alpha cells become active and start producing glucagon to reduce the intensity of that uh, hypoglycemia because right. glucagon is an anti insulin hormone but because uh, in secondary uh, diabetes due to pancreatitis uh, the pancreas is damaged as an organ they uh, there is a destruction of beta cells which secrete insulin as well as alpha okay. cells which is secreting the glucagon so this uh, patients have very brittle diabetes hmm. so with uh, uh, insulin they may get hypoglycemia very easily and serious hypoglycemia and they may get uh, hyperglycemia also very easily so the glycemic variability is uh, very much high in patients with uh, this pancreatic diabetes because of uh, dual loss the alpha cell as well as the beta cells and insulin in this requirements, type of... insulin requirements might be lower than type 1 because uh, there is loss of glucagon but at the cost of uh, increased risk of hypoglycemia hypoglycemia they're not able to balance wow okay the body has uh, made a very uh, means precise mechanism to balance so they yeah. have uh, nature has made insulin so nature has also made a glucagon so that a person do not develop a hypoglycemia due to insulin yeah but that uh, balance is uh, seriously disturbed in patients with uh, pancreatic diabetes Hmm. So Or they have to be very careful about their insulin and things like that. And uh, it is also called uh, type three also, but it's not a, yeah. a, a very very well recognized term. But uh, we yeah. also call it as a type three diabetes. Wow, type one, type two, type three, Modi, Lada, full acronyms, all numbers. <laughs> um, and let's sort of end with talking about diabetes insipidus, which is not di diabetes mellitus, but since it has the word diabetes, we should just cover it briefly. Yeah. So in diabetes insipidus, uh, first of all, the sh blood sugars are absolutely normal. So there is uh, no problem with the blood sugars. But the problem is with a hormone called uh, antidiuretic hormone, which is secreted uh, from the pituitary gland, which is uh, situated in our brain. So that uh, basically controls uh, uh, the water intake as well as the urine output uh, of an uh, individual. in diabetes insipidus uh, uh, due to either pancreas the uh, pituitary pathology or due to unknown reasons which we call idiopathic there is a loss of uh, this uh, adh producing cells anti diuretic hormone producing cells so the person develops uh, the uh, symptoms of uh, uh, polyuria polydipsia uh, and uh, there is no polyphagia because uh, in diabetes mellitus due to loss of glucose in the urine the person becomes more hungry but uh, in diabetes insipidus uh, there is no loss of glucose in the urine because the glucose is normal so uh, there is uh, only polyuria and polydipsia in uh, di but uh, typically patients with diabetes insipidus they drink around uh, 8 to 10 liters of water in 24 hours and they pass around uh, 8 to 10 liters of urine in 24 hours so as long as the uh, patients with diabetes insipidus match their urine output uh, with uh, oral fluid uh, they don't develop any problem right. but uh, due to any four circumstances say if uh, the person is bed ridden mm. uh, with diabetes insipidus and uh, the person doesn't have anybody to do uh, to take care of uh, for uh, and uh, the patient is left alone and the patient cannot uh, uh, drink uh, water by himself or herself then there is a chance of dehydration and yeah. uh, there is a chance of hypotension so right. as long as uh, the uh, patient with diabetes insipidus keep on drinking water there is uh, no problem in his or her health but the only problem is that uh, uh, there is a loss of sleep because uh, uh, during night also the uh, uh, person has to wake up to drink water to pass urine so they have to get up in night at least 3 uh, 4 times uh, uh, for uh, urine as well as drinking water so that may uh, affect the quality of life because they are not able to sleep properly so fortunately for diabetes insipidus we have medicine called uh, the anti diuretic hormone itself which is synthetically produced and it can be taken as a tablet or it can be taken as a nasal spray so it uh, basically it uh, replaces uh, the deficiency of uh, the anti diuretic hormone which the body is not producing naturally and 
that person is taking from outside. So and very again, similar to insulin. <laughs> yeah, very similar to insulin. But yeah, uh, fortunately for uh, the antidiuretic uh, hormone therapy, there are no side effects. For insulin, you have to cautious <laughs> about hypoglycemia. Yeah. But uh, with antidiuretic uh, hormone, there is no serious side effect. The only thing is that uh, if a person overtakes the antidiuretic hormone, then they may have a low sodium level. So typically, we undertreat uh, the patients with diabetic insipidus with uh, uh, this uh, antidiuretic hormone so that uh, they uh, do not develop the uh, signs and symptoms of water intoxication. Otherwise, they will retain more water. Right. True. So a fun story, everyone who's watching, is that so I have DI as well. And like he said, the symptoms of DI for me were very similar to the symptoms of hyperglycemia. If all of you know, when your sugar is high, when you have a hyper, you're thirsty, you're drinking water, you're going to the bathroom. So I was having this for constantly two, three nights. So I called up Dr. Ramesh and my sugars were normal. My sugars were normal, 128. And that is when he said, get these few tests done. And that's how we have the DI diagnosis as well. So you are now uh, ambassador for diabetes in general. <laughs> I, have, I have to start a new group now for DI. Yes. <laughs> Fabulous. No, this was absolutely fantastic. I think Dr. Ramesh has so beautifully explained all the types, the differences in the types, the differences in the treatments. And it's given us a very clear understanding that all types of diabetes are very different and distinct. So it's not enough to just say diabetes. Um, Dr. Ramesh, there are a lot of questions that have come in. I'm going to just ask a few that I can see over yes. here. We're not going to do um, like specific counseling over here. This is not the platform for that. But um, one of the questions I can see is um, pancreas transplant is a solution for type 1 diabetes? Question mark. Does it involve any risks? So pancreas uh, transplant is a solution. But uh, currently we are doing pancreas uh, transplant only in patients who are undergoing kidney transplant. So along with kidney transplant, uh, we can do a pancreas transplant. But uh, isolated pancreas transplant we are not uh, doing because... Uh, uh, the uh, donor availability is a big issue and uh, the other thing is that uh, the immunosuppression uh, which is uh, required for pancreas transplantation uh, may be more harmful than the uh, insulin therapy which a uh, type 1 diabetic patient is uh, routinely taking but uh, yeah. if you are doing a dual uh, kidney and uh, pancreatic transplant then immunosuppression is as such required for kidney transplant patients so you don't require extra immunosuppression for pancreatic transplant but it's a very rare thing very rare thing right very, it is very very rare not rare it is very very rare. <laughs> very rare okay so somebody has a question here saying that can a person with type 1 diabetes also get type 2 diabetes it's a very good question and uh, nowhere in the literature it is uh, mentioned but uh, i always uh, uh, speak in my seminars that we indians uh, are genetically insulin resistant right as a uh, as a ethnicity we are insulin resistant so if uh, a person with Indian ethnicity develops type 1 diabetes, then there are high chances that he or me, she may also be having a type 2 diabetes uh, later on in their life, no, not uh, immediately in the childhood. But uh, maybe if a person turns uh, 30, 40 or 40 plus, and if a person gains weight, then mm. there are chances that uh, there may be overlap of uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So. Uh, when should you suspect that a uh, type 1 is also type 2 now? So if a person starts gaining weight and you okay. can uh, you can make out the uh, cutaneous markers of the insulin resistance, which I said, then right. uh, you, uh, you should uh, think in the lines of uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the same person. And, uh, and require an addition of uh, treatment? Yeah. So insulin is as such required because uh, uh, type 1 uh, uh, is a uh, lifetime type 1. So yes. you can't uh, change your type. So type 1 would be always type 1. But if yes. there is an additional component of uh, type 2, then you can add a drug called metformin, which is insulin sensitizer. So basically it will uh, reduce your insulin dose, which you're taking from outside. Yes. It's not going to stop your insulin, but uh, it may control your sugar better with a lesser insulin. Fabulous. But still, uh, but still, we'll uh, call such people type 1 diabetes. We won't uh, call them type 1. Correct. Absolutely. Um, there is a question over here saying that if my C peptide is low, but I do not have a GAD positive, does that mean I'm type 1? 
or yes. not so th that is another thing uh, which i skipped uh, in my discussion but yes it has come up uh, so now i'll be speaking 95% of uh, type 1 diabetics they are autoimmune or auto antibody positive 95% okay. 5% of uh, type 1 diabetics uh, they have typical features of uh, type 1 diabetes like uh, uh, absolute insulin deficiency uh, prone for diabetic ketoacidosis lifelong insulin therapy uh, and uh, for a change this uh, patients uh, they have a family history of diabetes hmm. so that is one differentiating uh, thing from auto antibody positive type 1 diabetics so auto antibody negative type uh, 1 diabetics they are clubbed as idiopathic uh, type 1 diabetics we call okay. it idiopathic so the mechanism which we don't know but still uh, they are type 1 diabetic and they uh, amount to 5% of uh, type 1 diabetic population okay so and you can as they, are, they are to be treated with insulin, like with insulin. Uh, type 1 autoantibody positive patients. Fabulous. Um, and then this is a question that I'm sure you get asked a lot. But when will there be a cure for type 1 diabetes? So I always uh, uh, joke in my seminars that uh, uh, when I entered uh, the medical school <laughs> in 1988, I used to read about uh, this islet cell transplant and uh, the stem cell transplant. And I'm still reading about <laughs> and the stem cell transplant. True. We've all heard of the 10 year cure. Yeah, even after three decades, uh, the research is ongoing, but uh, uh, there is no breakthrough in the research. So one day there would be a breakthrough in the research and uh, we'll have a cure for type 1 diabetes. But when? It's very difficult to say. Maybe we can get it in five years. Maybe we have to wait for next 30 years. <laughs> True. So, so till then, insulin is your best friend. No, no, not yeah. stop. But All now right. there's uh, a closed loop uh, pumps would be available. Uh, yes. Shortly it would be available, the uh, closed loop pumps. So they will work as an artificial pancreas. And uh, uh, that would be means uh, not exactly a cure, but you would be able to manage your diabetes better right. with the closed loop pumps. Because in right. type 1 diabetes, the glycemic variability is huge. Yeah. So if uh, there are closed loop pumps, it will take care of the glycemic variability also and your HB1C also. Fabulous. There's a very interesting question. Um, can there be some, can I get ketones if my sugars are normal also? Yes. So that terminology is a euglycemic ketosis. Euglycemic ketosis means your blood glucose is typically normal, but uh, still you are having uh, ketones in your uh, blood or urine. So one of the scenario is that uh, if your oral intake has gone down significantly, so mm -hmm. either you are sick uh, or you are vomiting and mm -hmm. uh, you are still taking your insulin, but your carb intake, the oral intake has gone down significantly. So that will uh, produce a starvation ketosis. Mm. Starvation. So uh, because of that, uh, the symptoms of typical decay won't be there, like uh, vomiting, abdominal pain, or that uh, you must be uh, uh, say aware of a term called this fruity order you in your life. Yeah. So it won't be there. But uh, nonetheless, it has to be treated in lines of uh, the diabetic ketoacidosis. And in such cases, we along in the IV fluid, we give a uh, dextrose to right. replenish the lost calories. So once okay. you replenish the lost uh, calories with IV dextrose, then the ketones become negative. And it's not uh, as serious as uh, hyperglycemic uh, ketoacidosis. Right. Hyperglycemic uh, ketoacidosis is a more serious condition. Absolutely. But in euglycemic ketosis, you have to treat the underlying cause. That why a person is vomiting, why the person is not eating. So there has to be some underlying pathology, either a stomach infection or a chest infection, which is uh, reducing the oral intake of that person. So you have to treat that uh, condition. Right. Um, <laughs> I've always thought about uh, some Bethany is saying, I think type 1 diabetes should be renamed definitely to something like IR meaning insulin resistance. Bethany, I think it should be ID, insulin yeah, deficiency. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I clearly mentioned that type 1 diabetics don't have insulin resistance. They don't have. They have insulin they deficiency. Have, they have insulin deficiency. There's another question here, but I don't think uh, this is the correct platform. But AGP and why are these sensors so expensive? We all ask that question, little pancreas, little princess. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Ramesh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, AGP is a, a very good uh, tool uh, to monitor your diabetes. So,
so uh, you can uh, keep a close uh, watch on your uh, glycemic fluctuations and you can uh, modify your treatment also uh, based on the uh, agp trends so yeah. you can definitely reduce the uh, glycemic variability and your risk of going into serious hypoglycemia by using uh, this sensor and there are uh, uh, various uh, uh, sensors available so you can do a continuous glucose monitoring and or you can do a flash glucose monitoring so some are real time and some are retrospective but uh, uh, they are uh, very important to reduce the glycemic variability and ultimately it is reflected in better hba1c sure so i think That's all type 1 diabetics uh, if uh, cost is not a issue they should routinely use uh, some form of uh, the ambulatory glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring at least I intermittently think. if not continuously Yep, that's a good solution. If it's too pocket heavy, like he said, don't use it all the time, but maybe do it once a month, once in two months, as per. Um, okay, so I think I'm not going to take any more questions, but thank you for those questions. And I'm going to end this session with my set of questions, which is a rapid fire round with oh. Dr. Ramesh Goel. Okay. So let me and have a uh, cup of coffee. <laughs> yes, we coffee with Karan we're doing here. <laughs> but these are just random questions, Dr. Goel. They don't make yeah. any sense, but. Just quickly, whatever your preference is, all right? So CGM or SMBG, your preference? SMBG, because I am using it since... Uh, <laughs> True. Uh, MDI or pump? Pump. For type okay. 1 at least. For type 1. Not for type 2. But for type 1, yes, pump. Type 1 pump. Dokla or Thepla? Dokla. <laughs> Dokla. I like it. All right. Um, and they are or, healthy for type 1 also. That's true. That's true. Summer or winter? Summer. Yeah? Mangoes. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual conferences or physical conferences? Hybrid. Hybrid. That's cool. Yeah, yeah that's nice. <laughs> um, and finally, which tagline do you like more? Type the type or Are Diwano type pehchano? Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramesh. This has been an absolutely stunning session. We've got a lot of comments and questions. Everyone is saying this is so informative, very informative. So thank, thank you. you so much for taking out the time and doing this. And thank you for being so amazing. Your final messages to everyone before we end. So my final message is that uh, type 1 diabetes is not a disease. It is a condition. You can live a normal life uh, with type 1 diabetes with uh, all your uh, routine and the leisure activities and uh, mm, i think uh, in a couple of years the cure is around so be positive be positive not covid positive but be positive in your mind <laughs> and mind. Thank, you. thank you so much and everyone thank you guys and thank you diabetes for inviting thank you thank you so much it's been a pleasure having you here same here <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.